orbiting about 250 miles above the Earth. And we perform experiments on the International Space Station. We can do science, we can do experiments, we can learn how to do things out of this world. And the result will help benefit uh, the people on the ground. Space Station really provides an opportunity to uh, explore, for example, say medical applications. The aging and the osteoporosis and muscle wasting conditions are greatly accelerated in microgravity. The weightless environment will give us insights into things like diabetes and maybe even cancer. Understanding those phenomena allow us to look at how we can improve treatment of disease here on Earth. If we wouldn't have conducted experiments on the ISS, we wouldn't have known that you could use cold atmospheric plasma in such broad application areas we're now exploring. One of the most promising results has been gained by studying a protein associated with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We may be able to slow the disease by half, potentially doubling the lifespan of many of these DMD patients. We provided iServe imagery for many, many natural disasters, including floods and fires, for deforestations, for volcanic eruptions, and for earthquakes. So it was really a fantastic example showing how imagery from the International Space Station could be used in these times of dire need. This was when we realized we had a chance to make a difference in the world using the same technology that was used by NASA, but applied in a remote area of a developing country. I think it's, it's made people much more aware of the issues of water quality. That's a very powerful thing. Having the HICO on the International Space Station has been the ideal test bed for uh, our research. We can monitor these water bodies from space, and if we can reduce exposures both to humans and even animals, then we've achieved our goal. And now today, we're able to operate the largest fleet of Earth imaging satellites in human history and none of that would have been possible without the International Space Station. The space station has done so many things for life on planet Earth. It shows us what human beings can do working together. It shows the science that we can discover. Over 2,000 experiments have flown on board ISS. 170 countries around the world have participated in some fashion, either in the ISS itself or in one of the experiments. Our uh, rate of research is actually increasing. We're doing more today on board the space station for, uh, for research uh, than we have ever done before, and that's only going to continue in the future. And so what we're seeing today is a proliferation of new ideas and new concepts. It's almost like it's a renaissance of what's happening in space. Buckle up and strap down because this is going to be a rocket for all of us in the global community to be part of. Thank you very much, everybody. Welcome back to our plenary session on the benefits for humanity innovations from the International Space Station. I'm Julie Robinson. I've been the chief scientist for the International Space Station now for over a decade, which means I've had the pleasure of working with many of you in this room, and I look forward to working with many of you who are new users in the room as well. One of the things and the promises that came as we, the decision was made by our government on behalf of the taxpayers to build this amazing vehicle in space. One of the reasons for that was the promise that as we push the technology frontier and as we push the scientific frontier, we would also then bring benefits back here on Earth. And honestly, from the first year that crew members were on board the International Space Station, those stakeholders then came back and asked us what have we done for them lately? Had we accomplished anything that benefited life here on Earth? Over the last uh, over many years now, what we've learned are two important things. First, that science takes time, and secondly, that you can't always predict which great application is going to suddenly burst on the scene and make a huge impact. And so in this plenary session, uh, really each year at the conference, we try to bring to you some of the stories of the benefits that are coming from the International Space Station. Sometimes they're early on, they're suggestions of things that could happen, Sometimes they are cases where we can actually identify human beings alive today on Earth because of some technology or some capability that originally came from the International Space Station. So in our panel today, we have three very distinctive 
different kinds of scientists who have done very different work. They're, they're not the kinds of scientists that would normally be on a panel together. They would normally be seen as leaders in their discipline at one of their discipline conferences, talking to their peers. And yet we've brought them together today to talk to you not only about how their own work may be benefiting life here on Earth someday, but also to speculate and think about, in general, what does this tell us about the space station as an innovation platform? So I'm pleased to introduce first my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Randy Giles. He is the chief scientist of CASIS, the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, now for a year, and it's been great working with Randy over the past year. He came to CASIS after 30 years of research and research management at Bell Laboratories in the physical sciences. Next to him is Dr. Andrew Paul Feinberg. He's professor of medicine, oncology, molecular biology, and genetics at the School of Medicine of Johns Hopkins University. He is an investigator on the famous and perhaps infamous NASA twin study, uh, the first comprehensive study of genetic effects of the human body in long duration spaceflight but also uh, you know, well-regarded scientists really pushing the edge of how genetics and medicine combine together to influence our health. Next to him is Dr. Peter Weiner, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Clinical and Biological Engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He has been an investigator over many years, uh, clear back to the uh, microgravity science lab missions on the space shuttle in fluid physics, and most recently using the ISS as a platform for his research in fluid physics. And he is, uh, just a few weeks from now, going to be a recipient of the NASA Technology Achievement Medal as well. And uh, next to him, then, at the end, is Dr. Paul C. Joss, Professor Emeritus of the Physics Department at MIT. He's also Senior Vice President for Research of Visidine Incorporated and the founder and chief technology officer of Tropical Weather Analytics, Inc., uh, a company that he founded based on the applications that he'll talk about today from his work on the International Space Station. And he had served as the principal investigator of the tropical cyclone investigation on the International Space Station. So with this great panel for you, we're going to uh, ask them a lot of questions. We're gonna try to keep it a little less formal than a standard PowerPoint kind of briefing. We'll have an opportunity uh, for Randy and I to ask them a few questions, and then we will also have the opportunity for you to ask a few questions. And there are some microphones um, somewhere out in the audience uh, that we'll use when we come to that. So please make sure you get a microphone. I think there'll be some people walking around with them to uh, take your questions towards the end of the session. So without any further ado, let me turn it over to uh, Randy to start some of our questions. Thank you, Julie. Uh, good morning, everybody here in the audience. Thank you, Andy, Peter, and Paul for joining us on the stage today for this intimate conversation that we'll share with 970 others. And so we'll get started with you, Andy. Okay. You know, you're a leading authority in epigenetics, which is the study of how uh, genes expression gets changed by environmental factors rather than looking at changes in the genetic code itself. You're also a principal investigator in the uh, twin study, which you just heard of from Julie. Can you describe to us what your research is about and how it factors into this twin study that we're conducting now? Sure, I'd be delighted to. I think there's some slides. Um, are they, do I see them here? Where are they? The Over there. <laughs> okay, so I need to see what's on them, so I'm going to stand up. Actually, I'm improvising here. Okay, there we go. So, um, so what epigenetics, that's what we're studying, what epigenetics is about it, it has to do with the fact that um, even if you have the perfect genome, like David does on the left, things work out pretty well developmentally. The Mediterranean diet is not without its benefit as well, and you could see what happens if you put him on a Western diet. So same genome, but not the same result. And the reason is because of this extra layer of information besides the genetic code that we call epigenetics. You see the exact same gene, uh, the, on the top and on the bottom, but on the top that gene is turned on, on the bottom that gene is turned off. And what epigenetics has to do with is regulating those genes, making them be on or off appropriately, and that's influenced not just by the DNA sequence, but also by the environment. Things like diet, things like radiation exposure, things like infection, and other things, stress. So many different things that an astronaut might experience as well. And you can see the genes look different. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about 
what those are, but one of the changes is a chemical change in the DNA called DNA methylation, where of the four building blocks, there's an extra chemical CH3 group or a methyl group that's stuck on the DNA that's associated with silencing. So we, um, uh, there's 10 different labs that are involved in this project. Our particular project was to look at uh, DNA methylation and that turning on and off of genes uh, between the identical twins, uh, Mark and Scott Kelly. Scott, of course, was in space. Mark was on the ground. And it was incredibly interesting. I mean, there was science itself in figuring out how to collect samples that are going to be scientifically legitimate at the standards that we require for our sorts of analyses and the other investigators as well, M regularizing those samples between time points and also in a way that the investigators are going to be studying essentially the same material, avoiding things like batch effects, and then relating that to real physiology. So it's pretty interesting and working that into the timeline of NASA, the other requirements and so forth. And I'm showing you like an overall picture of the results. So those are pairs of samples where Scott is the light blue bar and um, and um, Mar uh, Mark is the, um, uh, the green bar. And um, that is the range and, and mean of uh, DNA methylation entropy, or randomness, or variability. I'll show you the actual mean results. But that's sort of how variable DNA methylation is in purified um, lymphocytes called CD4 cells that are obtained in space and before space. The first picture is from before space. The next two are during the space flight, and then and the last pair is after space flight. And you could see that they actually diverged, which was pretty exciting. Um, and if I uh, zoom in on a particular gene, that's Scott versus Mark. And on the top is that entropy or variability, which is higher in Scott. And the bottom is um, the mean levels of methylation, which is um, lower in Scott. The loss of methylation is associated with activation of genes, and that gene is the uh, telomerase gene. So there is a change in DNA methylation that occurred over the space flight, came back to normal, actually in both twins, and um, uh, that we could then relate to gene expression and telomerase activity uh, experiments that are related, of course, to things like aging uh, that were done by other investigators. So that sort of summarizes a little window into that work. Thanks, Andy. Sure. So, uh, you know, epigenetics is a really hot area of research here on Earth. What do you feel like you gained? What did you learn compared to what you thought you would see pre-flight as you look at this data today? And did yeah. going to space make a difference? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the question from, from, from Casis' point of view is how did what we do might benefit what we do here on Earth and how we understand things? And there really was, because um, even though there's only one twin pair, I was, I mean, our hypothesis, we would see a difference, obviously. Uh, but I still was pleasantly surprised to see that that was right. And we could see over a relatively short period of time of six months, differences between two identical twins that are in different environments uh, that um, could, could potentially be meaningful in terms of um, disease. And of course, their genomes are the same, and the genomes should be the same through flight, uh, as our genomes should be relatively stable. But the epigenetics changes, and that means that's something that doctors on Earth hopefully will be able to use in the future uh, in order to track disease or anticipate it or catch it early, uh, things like that. So I think it's, uh, it shows this is actually something you can do to um, track health on Earth. Interesting. So in a sense, it looks like epigenetics is the convergence of nature and nurture, if I was going to put it that way. <laughs> Very fascinating. So I want to ask another question here. You know, we see from this experience in, in space flight, astronauts in space, that there's bone loss, muscle wasting, uh, balance loss, and other detrimental health conditions. And people often think of using space environment to study diseases at an accelerated rate, because these are happening very quickly in our crew in the absence of countermeasures. What do you think about this hypothesis that we can use the observations and tests on astronauts in space to inform us about diseases here at Earth at a more accelerated rate of understanding? Well, I think, uh, I think that's a very reasonable idea. Of course, with just one twin pair, we can't say anything 
by definition, about how the environment changed their genome or epigenome over that time period, because it could have happened on Earth, too. But we know that there are differences one can observe, and we also know we have the technical abil ability to study additional astronauts. So I think that what we really need to do going forward is extend this genomic and epigenomic uh, era into all astronauts as they travel into space and, and collect that information and relate it to environmental signals. And I think that the, the legitimate and interesting things that have been found as models of human disease from space um, flight already, um, we may understand mechanisms of that. And there's another very important one, which is, of course, radiation exposure. We know that the epigenome is very much involved in the response to um, radiation injury and may even induce mutations. And so we're going to need to measure that. Right now, they're in relatively safe, low Earth orbit, but to go to Mars is a different story. So I think it's going to be really important to measure these changes, maybe even develop uh, chemopreventive measures that could affect uh, their ultimate um, DNA damage based upon the genes that we find identified. So I think that it really opens the door to this sort of advanced um, genomic study of, uh, of, of the medicine of astronauts and also how that might affect uh, people, you know, here as well. Okay. Thank you. We'll shift gears just a little bit now uh, from human physiology and medicine to fluid physics. And uh, Peter, you know, you really used microgravity at a fundamental level in your work for many, many years. Uh, can you tell us uh, what the work, about the work that you've done in heat transfer and kind of give us a big overview of that? Sure, we'll use the first, uh, Transparency. <laughs> and I, Go ahead and walk to the, if you want to stand. stand. Well, uh, let's make sure I can see what's on it. <laughs> There's one on each side. <laughs> oh, so. all right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I don't think we have the complete transparency, but that's all right. We can start with this part. I, uh, we don't have the diagram of the system. It's the wrong, it's the wrong image. But that's all right. We'll, that's all right. we'll jump around a bit. Uh, first thing, uh, let, let let's... Let me promise our audience, first and foremost, we did have a graphical version of this, not an equation for you, so sorry about that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, Let's look at the title, Evaporation, Condensation, and Interfacial Fluid Flow in Heat Pipes. Uh, essentially, uh, what we did is uh, we designed a special heat pipe that would be useful in microgravity. It was a uh, start off with a glass cuvette with an internal diameter of uh, 3 by 3 millimeters and a length of about 40 millimeters and it worked on interfacial phenomena. Uh, let's see uh, where... Turns out, I have to uh, apologize, but we did. So originally what we're thinking about is discussing small dimensions in large dimensions. Essentially on the Earth, what we have is flow through porous media with evaporation, and they have heat pipes that are uh, porous media, liquid flow, evaporation, condensation, and flow back. However, in the Earth's environment, gravity, of course, is substantial. Therefore, you need small diameters. And you can think about if you have a capillary tube and the liquid goes up a small distance, and you design your system based on that. Now, if you go into microgravity, what happens is you can use large dimensions. If you use large dimensions, you can get more fluid flow, more evaporation, and a better heat transfer process. That is, you know, we'll say it's a conceptual view. Now what happens is you go into microgravity on the space station and you look at what's happening, and you have many surprises. To me, the biggest surprise was the fact of the sensitivity of the system to evaporation. Now, from a general scientific point of view, this is interesting, at least to me, from the following point of view. If you think of an astronaut, and they show you an astronaut walking around the Earth, 
and you see them at a natural pace. Now we take that astronaut and we put him on the space station and he tries to move and all of a sudden he bounces into the wall because the, everything is very sensitive. And the reason it's sensitive, at least easily in hindsight, is we're talking about microgravity, 10 to the minus six changes in the force field. So in interfacial phenomena, there are 10 to the minus six changes in the interfacial force field. If you bump something, if you move something, all of a sudden the fluid mechanics changes, the heat transfer changes. And what we come up with the general idea, which of course is very straightforward, that in microgravity, everything is going to be very sensitive in a different way. And the easy way to think about it is you look at the astronaut. And this is just uh, the Bond number, which, uh, which it just tells us from a fundamental point of view, if you take gravity, in one case, 1g, the other case, 10 to the minus 6, and you multiply it by the characteristic dimensions, in this case, radius of curvature and thickness, you find out that you can have much larger dimensions because you have much smaller gravitational field. So it turns out that interfacial phenomena is a fundamental process or phenomena that is really understudied and very important. I know very little about anatomy, but think about your skin. You have to evaporate, it's a membrane, it's interfacial phenomena, which you never think about, but which is very important, of course. I think we can go on to a video. Uh, what do we have here? Oh, I'm sorry, that's the last one. We'll come, well, since we already have the transparency up there right now, we can skip the video and go back to it. This essentially answers a question that they asked me. What would you do in the future if you had something that you wanted to study? And I said, well, uh, let's see, what's important today? Of course, solar energy, energy systems, evaporation. So I would build a, just a simple conceptual porous device where you have liquid on one side, it's sucked in, and then you have evaporation on the bottom side, and you get a vapor. Vapor has a particular pressure and temperature. Now you say, well, that's very simple. However, it turns out everything is controlled by the bottom surface, the interfacial phenomena at the exit. And then you can start combining ideas and you say, well, let's see, uh, do we know anything about that? In reality, we know very little about that because interfacial phenomena, uh, interf intermolecular force is a very broad field. So we can go into this broad field and think of all different concepts that need to be studied. But the important thing is, can we get high pressure, high temperature, we'll say steam coming off the bottom. The power, of course, comes from the solar energy. Turns out the same type of equations are used to understand solar energy being absorbed by the bottom surface and the evaporation uh, condensation phenomena. So there's a very general need to understand interfacial phenomena, and this is just an application from a conceptual point of view. Uh, do you think we can get the video, or what do we have here? Oh, okay. Uh, we can just start. In other words, this is just a 1G application. Here you have a video. Your laptop uh, uh, obviously heats up. It has to be cooled. And what this video shows it is the application of a porous device to cool it. Essentially, that's a heat pipe. You have liquid flow in a porous media, evaporation, then vapor goes from a passive mechanism to another location where you get condensation. And so it's a fluid physics, evaporation, condensation, capillary flow, interfacial phenomena. Now say you wanted to take this, of course, into microgravity, and it would work as well in microgravity as that picture. However, you might want to have it working better so you use the results of a large device to see if you can make a better heat transfer process that would be useful 
and microgravity uh, in your computer or maybe just the cooling device of the electronics. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> so, Peter, actually, I, I think he was relatively understated in the message here. Many of us just think of uh, heat and, and cooling things as heat sinks, fans, maybe water cooling, things like that. But I think I could make the assertion that Moore's Law would have come to a grinding halt a long time ago if we couldn't figure out how to move heat away from the active components and dissipate it whether it be the nanoelectronics on a chip to mega data centers, moving of heat away from what's being generated so that the devices can operate is of fundamental importance. I think that's really clear. So my question, Peter, is that as you look forward from your investigations, what else can be done to further our technological advancement so that heat doesn't hinder us? Well, yeah, you, what you need to do is you need to look at this from uh, two points of view. One, what is your application? So you take your application and you say, oh, this is how I maybe would like to design something. And what, but you want a high efficiency. So you move it from an engineering point, it's very simple. You know, you want to run some experiment, you put, heat it up, you cool it, you measure delta T, and you get a heat transfer coefficient. However, that doesn't help you optimize it. So to optimize it, you have to go into science. So when you go into science, you start talking about intermolecular forces. Now, what's the advantage of the space station is all of a sudden, all the dimensions are made larger. As soon as they're made larger, you can see more. We take video pictures of the process, and then we can analyze it, and we can get confirmation of models. Then we can take those models that we're able to evaluate because of better data in microgravity, and then apply them to uh, a device, we'll say, on the Earth, like the solar thermal converter. So there's a synergy. There's a synergy between gravity and microgravity, measurements and use. There's a synergy between, of course, engineering and science. But science is much more complicated. And uh, I always think about the power of engineering is if you go to a launch and you see the rocket go up. You can hear it, you can feel it, you can see it. However, what's happening in there is a bunch of small micro droplets evaporating. That's what's controlling it. <laughs> Somehow, uh, it all works together. I see. Great. So, Peter, you're t you, you talked a little bit about the way that in microgravity you can use a different scaling of process. Another way I've heard that said is, I think similar, but a different way of framing it, is to say that you can do simpler modeling when you don't have buoyancy-driven convection and so forth. So what is the power of simplifying the mathematics in leading to a new engineering design? Uh, what is the power? Uh, basically, I will say originally, I was an engineer, experimentalist. So on one side, uh, you can just uh, measure what's going on. But on the other side, what you need is the science. So you have to go into the microscopic intermolecular forces and uh, so in that case, though, the equations get complicated. So on the science side, the equations are very complicated, need a tremendous amount of analysis. One of the advantages of being in academia is you have smart graduate students who will do a lot of work because they want to graduate, and they can you know, handle all the equations, the computers, the modeling, you know. My job is easy. I can do the concept and have a simple equation like we had up there on the first slide. Just look at a ratio of forces, you know, microgravity versus gravity, and tells you about dimensions. Okay. One, 
one big difference between your work and Andy's work, Andy doesn't need a lot of specialized hardware. He needs humans, which are, I guess, a form of specialized hardware, but he doesn't need um, specific equipment. You, on the other hand, your experiments have always depended on some custom equipment to help you do the fluid physics study. Can you talk about the difference between when you did work on shuttle to the work that you do, you've done on the space station most recently in the equipment? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess what made me very excited working with NASA is first you have to realize being an experimentalist, you take chances in your own lab. One thing that was interesting, what we did is very simply, we look at, use a microscope to take a picture of the interface between a liquid and a solid. What you do is if you have the liquid vapor interface, you get reflectivity. At the liquid solid interface, you get reflectivity. So we were able to take pictures to show us the shape. Now, the thing on the space station though, when we asked NASA to do this for us, well, they set up a video camera and, they, and a microscope. And besides that, uh, they, design some of the experiments, and it turns out, here's what happened. If you take a frame, one single frame from your video, essentially it's 500, 500 pixels. That's 250,000 pixels. Now each pixel in your camera is a reflectometer. So we have 250,000 reflection points in the data. Now, of course, what we have is various locations. So we had 100 different squares that we measured in our device. Now, of course, a video camera is 30 times a second, 60 seconds a minute, et cetera, et cetera. And we ran it for days. The space station allowed us to take all that data, ship it out to the cloud, and uh, record everything. So, uh, and then, of course, the dimensions. The dimensions are much larger. And the whole idea of the effect of gravity on the intermolecular forces is just amazing. So you come up with the ability on a unique platform to be able to design new cooling systems. And of course we have satellites up there. Those satellites need to be cooled. What's the best type of cooling system to have? Without the space station, we wouldn't know. Well, Paul, we're going to go over to you now. So you're, you're the one panelist here who didn't look at microgravity as the opportunity. Rather, you looked at the station as being your eye in the sky, looking down from 400 kilometers at phenomena here on Earth. Um, so can you tell us why you chose the ISS as a platform to do your tropical cyclone research and the advantages it gave you and some of the results that you acquired from your studies? Well, as you just said, what we used the ISS for was to study tropical cyclones. Uh, the first two questions that might come to mind uh, are, what is a tropical cyclone and why should I care? Uh, tropical cyclones are called hurricanes if they occur in the Atlantic Basin. Over most of the Pacific Ocean, they're called typhoons, and there are other names in other parts of the world, but they're all physically the same kind of storm, and atmospheric scientists call them tropical cyclones, and that's the name I'll use unless I slip and say hurricanes, because that's what I'm used to saying. Uh, the, the only, the tropical cyclones are the most devastating natural catastrophe on Earth. The, the, the greatest natural catastrophe in the history of the United States was a hurricane that hit Galveston, Texas in the year 1900 an estimated 10,000 people died. The greatest loss of life from a natural disaster in the history of the world was a typhoon that hit Bangladesh in 1970, 
where the death estimates go up as high as 600,000 people. Uh, Hurricane Sandy in 2012, which hit the east coast of the United States, uh, did an estimated uh, an excess of $70 billion worth of damage. That's billion with a B, which makes it the most devastating natural event in the history of the world in terms of, of uh, damage. Um, it, it beats earthquakes, it, it beats wildfires, it, be, it beats volcanic ex explosions, the biggest ones, whatever you care to name. The only exception is if an asteroid hits the Earth. Uh, and for any one of you out there, uh, your chances of dying in a hurricane are about equal to your, your chances of dying from an asteroid hitting the Earth. The thing about asteroids is that they only hit the Earth once every 100 million years or so. The last one hit 64 million years and killed all the large life forms, essentially, uh, the land-based life forms, the dinosaurs. And um, if one hit today, uh, well, maybe we would be clever enough to, for uh, at least some of humanity to survive, but probably most people on the Earth would die, and that would be all at once. But, Earth, but, but tropical cyclones do that at the um, average pace of 20,000 people per year every year throughout history. The single quantity that tells you the most about how much damage and how many lives are going to be lost in a when a tropical cyclone hits land is the pressure at sea level in the clear eye at the center of the storm. The only place that, uh, the only country that does those kinds of measurements is the United States. We send out Hurricane Hunter aircraft to measure those, those pressures. We do that uh, for a storm maybe every 12 hours, every six hours at the most. Uh, other country, uh, and we have, so we have that information available for the United States and we share it with nearby countries, Mexico, the, the islands of the Caribbean, and so forth. Other countries have no such protection. They only have the crudest estimates of how strong these storms are gonna be before they hit. And so, as a result, I mean, it, it, it cuts both ways. Sometimes they overestimate how strong it's going to be, do a, go to a great deal of trouble to evacuate populations and, and, and infrastructure, rolling stock, and so forth. The storm is a fizzle. The next time people get a, get a, a warning of a, a catastrophic storm coming, they say, ah, it's another one of those. I'll, I'll, I'll ignore it. And uh, 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 devastating effects result, uh, result. The other way around, a storm is underestimated in, in strength. Then people say, OK, no point in worrying about it. I'll just stay here at home and board up my windows. And a, a storm surge that's 30 feet high comes in, and everyone dies. So having accurate measurements of the strength of these storms and, and then putting those into numerical weather prediction codes to, um, to determine how strong the storm is going to be when it hits land is of great importance in saving both human life and property. Uh, we, uh, uh, since uh, 2014, we've been investigating on the ISS a remote method of, of measuring the, the central pressure in a tropical cyclone. Uh, most of the quantities that need to be measured are, uh, can be measured with uh, equipment that's close to being off the shelf. The, the one quantity that is not in that category is the heights of the clouds just outside the central eye at the center of the storm. So, That's me. <laughs> I need it. And this is a photograph taken um, from the, the, the couple on the International Space, Space Station. Um, one of the crew members, we, we, we let them know where a tropical cyclone is, if it's going to be close to the, the, the ground track of the, of the ISS. As it makes an overpass, we can see out to about 1,200 kilometers and get good information. Here is the, I don't know if you, here's the eye of this, no, 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 no. Here is the eye of this particular storm. And this one, it, you hear the eye is clear. Often they're not, they're more like part, partly cloudy. This is Typhoon Atsani in August of 2015. And then outside the eye is the so-called eye wall, 
where the most devastating winds, the tidal surge uh, driving uh, walls of, of ocean water as high as 30 feet high when the storm comes inland, and in incredibly torrential rainfall occurs. Now, what we can do from the International Space Station is just a, it's a, it's an ideal height. It's at 400 kilometers. And so, and it's moving at seven kilometers a second. And it sweeps by one of these storms in about a minute. That's about 400 and some odd kilometers in a minute. So if uh, the storm is here, and I'm looking at something in the background, and then a minute later, I look at the storm like this, the angle from me from, uh, on the International Space Station to the storm here has changed. And I can use that information point by point within the storm to determine the height above sea level of every point in the storm, including these, these very high cloud tops, actually the highest clouds that we ever see of ordinary types of clouds uh, near the center of the storm. So we can, we can use that, to, that parallax effect to, make a, to reconstruct a three-dimensional image of the, of the um, eye and eye wall of the storm. Uh, the next slide will show that, and you all have um, some uh, paper copies and, and, and 3D glasses on your tables. Uh, I'll just mention in passing that I've discovered that the, you, you're welcome to take those home with you, of course, and I've discovered that um, kids, your children and grandchildren, love these things. They bring them into show and tell and in class and all that kind of thing. So please feel free to take them home with you and show them around. Uh, you should be able to see the, the changes in height. These are some of the highest clouds in the eye wall, and they're much higher than these, these broken clouds in the eye of the storm itself. So that demonstrates what we set out to demonstrate, which is that we can measure the altitudes of these clouds. It's the first time that this has been done by any means from space, the first remote measurements of the, of the heights of these clouds. Thanks a lot, Paul, and I hope everyone's going to enjoy bringing those home and getting their kids excited about it as well, so that's great. Thanks for bringing those along. Um, at breakfast this morning, you know, you talked a lot about why the modeling of hurricanes isn't sufficient today, but um, what advantages do you have if you can really, instead of sending a hurricane hunter, what, what are sort of the global economic impacts if you could have full tropical coverage of every hurricane that's out there? Well, our ultimate goal is to, is to fly a, a small constellation of four microsatellites, which will enable us to fly over every tropical cyclone worldwide every hour and a half. Uh, that's even much more frequently than, than the United States does with Hurricane Hunter aircraft. Uh, I, I didn't mention, but no other country on Earth can afford that sort of thing. It's not done anywhere else. It, it, it's just, you know, the United States has the infrastructure and resources to do it, other countries don't. So if, unless you're in the United States or you border the United States, you, you just don't have that kind of information. Um, we will, and even then, it's only every six to 12 hours. We can measure, we'll measure every single tropical cyclone worldwide every hour and a half. And that information, measure by measure, I mean measure the intensity in terms of that central pressure, that information can be fed into numerical weather prediction codes to produce much more accurate forecasts as one of these storms approaches a shoreline, makes landfall, and in fact, then we can even get real-time measurements of the storm's intensity as it hits land and comes inland. You know, certainly, you know, hurricanes are devastating. They're tremendous menace, menace to oh, world yeah, population. Oh, right, I, I didn't answer that part of Julie's question. <laughs> um, we estimate very roughly that uh, with the information that we can provide, which will be of enormous benefit to all of the world and, and very substantial benefit to the United States because we'll, we'll be able to generate much more information than, than Hurricane Hunter aircraft do because we can do it much more frequently, that will translate into an annual reduction in property damage in the vicinity of 10 to 15 billion dollars worldwide, and an average reduction, rough, approximately, uh, in loss of life worldwide of 10,000 lives per year. So, when, if if a data set like that were available globally, 
you know, one of the powerful things that, that NASA does in Earth system science is put different data sets from different satellites together. And I think it's amazing to imagine if, if you had a constellation of satellites giving you those cloud heights and could combine it with things like sea surface temperature measurements from AVHRR and so forth. Do you think you could actually make new discoveries about the ways that hurricanes strengthen? Yes. Uh, it turns out that tropical cyclones play a crucial role in the circulation of heat in the Earth's atmosphere, the, the, the transfer of heat in the tropics where the sun shines down most directly toward the poles where it radiates away to space. Uh, the hurricanes form in the tropics and move toward the poles. And, and they're such massive and powerful things that they do a, a substantial amount of that. There are vast stretches of ocean where we have little or no knowledge of how intense these storms are, how much heat they might be carrying from the tropics to the ocean. So when we have this information, which we will accumulate over a period of a few years, uh, we will be able to uh, have a statistical database to, to determine how much heat is being carried. That will be very important for global climate models. And in, in turn, a better global climate model, if it tells you that, the, say, the sea surface temperatures are heating up, will give you information about whether hurricanes and, and typhoons, tropical cyclones in general, are going to get stronger or weaker with time. In general, warmer ocean waters, because of global warming, would produce stronger storms in the future. So we would, that would be the first data set that would fill in that gap in the current global climate models. Pretty powerful stuff. Well, we, uh, we want to broaden our conversation um, even to a higher level now with these great panelists and, and ask some general questions and get your perspectives, your different perspectives on some of those questions. So, uh, Randy, why don't you start? Sure. First question, in fact, I'll, I'll give it back to Andy here. Was there anything unexpected or surprised to you in your investigations that are going to lead to new investigations or new insights, or like they're a starting point to new directions? Yeah, it was sort of a parallel study. Uh, so when we got started, um, uh, you, you know, everything's figured out to the minute with the astronauts and, and their time resources and even things like the energy required um, to spin a centrifuge. That all has to be calculated. Um, and so we ran up to th this logistical hurdle because of the novelty of the study about how uh, much they can really do themselves. I mean, it would be great if they could do some of the things we do in our own laboratories. And we were told that it hadn't progressed to the point where they really could do much in terms of sample handling, which would really increase the sophistication, the speed of doing things. Like we saw this beautiful thing about students doing PCR and so forth. But I mean, to get their time and to handle materials and all of that, um, it's, um, it's not so easy. So, um, um, you know, so we were told that, you know, there might be issues of blood handling, that the blood could disperse all over the place, and like a big blood droplet would like wind up on the ignition thing, and off it goes to Mars on its own or something. And so, <laughs> so, but we got NASA to agree to let us uh, model this um, in the zero gravity um, uh, airplane. And so we actually worked out the, the mechanisms for doing pipetting and, um, like actually, Kate Rubens was on the flight with me, and so we wound up collaborating with her, uh, and uh, she wound up employing some of this, uh, this methodology in her recent um, trip. And now I think it's accepted as fairly routine. So the sophistication, we even did on the zero G, we did some sequencing, and then she was able to do that uh, in space. So um, now we know that we'll be able to do much more sophisticated work. I think that was a big surprise to everybody. And then actually the NASA engineer, uh, the senior engineer who had the spielkes about this in the first place um, is, was a co-author on our paper with us. So I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for this going forward. So in some sense, the, the surprise was the challenge of doing your research on the station mm -hmm. and then finding that getting solutions to those challenges was itself an endeavor. Yes, uh, that's very right. Interesting. Yep. Very interesting. What about you, Peter? What did you find unusual, unexpected, either leading to new methods of doing your research on the station or on the shuttle prior to that, or results themselves that sort of inform you to what's sort of the next thing to happen, which you really didn't think of when you first started? Well, yes, let's go back to uh, that idea of stability and fluctuations. Uh, Say if they, some company X comes to me and says, you know, we want our laptop uh, computer, we want to take it up on the space station, 
but we understand that you know something about cooling and we would want to have a better cooling system because it heats up. Well, from a conceptual point of view, you know, we would design something bigger because of the buy-it number, and we'd say, oh, yeah, you get more flow and everything like that. And very simply, you would first focus on the idea, well, in microgravity, everything's going to be much, quote, easier because, you know, the interfacial forces only have to overcome 10 to the minus 6 in gravity. Uh, so then you build this device, and you find out, oh, we have to worry about perturbations because the perturbations only have to be 10 to the minus 6 smaller. And all of a sudden, you have unstable systems. So even though ahead of time, from a conceptual point of view, you can think of these things, but until you do the experiment, you really do not know what's going to happen. And I can say that our experimental results from one point of view were what we expected. It worked better. But from another point of view, there are all different areas in this simple devices that was different than we expected. So if you're actually trying to cool something when you're building something, you'd design it probably improperly. So it would change your ability to design. And in order to change your ability to design, you'd have to run the experiments to find out what's going on. And the only place you can run those experiments are on the space station if you want the device to work, you know, in microgravity in a satellite. But the interesting thing about these kind of studies is you can then, there's a synergism. In other words, in microgravity, you can make easier measurements because you can see everything better through the microscope and so on, and, but you can use that on Earth. So it's a very general phenomena of use in both environments. But the, what surprised me the most is going back to that astronaut, that actually the astronaut would hit the wall if he's in the space station. <laughs> yeah, that, Peter, that was a really nice way of summarizing an important general principle for engineering in space. Because when you change all the parameters around a system, your intuition's wrong. So your intuition about things that are easier is wrong. Your intuition about things that might interrupt or, or disrupt a process is wrong. And I think, I mean, that's why there are so many people in the room who are interested in technology demonstration on the space station. Because you, you try something in space, it never performs the way you thought it was, mm -hmm. even after 50 years of human spaceflight. The thermal systems aren't quite what we thought they would be. The life support systems aren't quite what we thought. So what you're saying is, Abandon intuition, all who enter the space station. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting thought. Well, let's not go that far. <laughs> Use your intuition, but be guarded with it, maybe. <laughs> Very interesting. So, Paul, uh, same question to you. What was unexpected, different, is making you think of new things to do? Well, as, as we went along, we realized that this was working the way that we wanted it to, and now we want to go on to our constellation, small constellation of microsatellites, four. Um, they're not cheap, but they're not terribly expensive. The equipment isn't, isn't all that. And we're just launching them into low Earth orbit, very, very similar to uh, the, IS, the ISS, about 400 kilometers. Um, the most expensive thing turns out to be that we have to inject each of the four satellites into a, a very precise orbit, which means it needs its own uh, launch vehicle and launch. We can't big piggyback on anyone else. And those, you know, when you want your own dedicated launch, that's a very expensive thing. So, and, and then when we go to ask for, now, now that we have a, have a for-profit company, uh, we go to venture capitalists or, or potential uh, corporate partners. Uh, the typical response is, well, uh, this theory is, is beautiful, uh, and the equations are so elegant. Now show me an actual result before I'll give you any money. So we have to get over that little hump. So our next step actually is going to be is to fly uh, drones, lighter than air drones. They will look like zeppelins, hmm. and they will fly at 20 kilometers, 66,000 feet, which is higher than almost anything else ever flies. And they will be able to fly at 130 kilometers per hour, if a hurricane is forming, say, over the eastern Atlantic off the coast of Africa, Cape Verde, we can fly one of these things out there and meet it on the way and then follow it all the way in to the United States uh, because they're lighter than air and we, and we drive power, of course, from solar power. 
We can stay up there for weeks to months and follow actually several of these storms. Uh, and then we will, we will you know, have concrete results and we'll, we will already be producing results that will benefit the, numer the numerical weather prediction codes, thereby benefiting humanity. And we'll, then that, and we'll have that. The first one of those, of those drones will, is scheduled to go up at, at the, around the end of 2018, so about a year and a half from now. And then our hope is that that will give us uh, enough impetus to go on to our, our small constellation uh, maybe a few years after that. So that's actually quite a portfolio then. From what you learned on station in space, you're thinking of space with microsatellites, but you're now thinking of the upper atmosphere as well as sort of another Yes, sort of quasi-satellites at 20 kilometers. And they can do a lot of other things too. I mean, they can, you can sit over a forest fire, a huge forest fire, and track it in real time, and it'll just sit there. Mm -hmm. it'll, because it's lighter than air, it can just sit in one spot, and it'll sit there for weeks. It, we can follow oil spills because of, because of pipeline ruptures, that sort yep. of thing. And this will be of great uh, benefit to humanity, but it will also, we hope, be a moneymaker. And you all can get on the ground floor. Just write your checks out to Paul Joss. <laughs> Turn it in to me at the end of the <laughs> session. And a, a dollar a share, dollar a share. And you're, 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 it's like getting in on the ground floor of Apple or Microsoft or Amazon. <laughs> I got to tell you, I had this script here. That wasn't on it. <laughs> but thank you, Paul. <laughs> Check will come later. You know, something that you mentioned, though, in terms of, of fundraising, you know, as scientists, we, we're always trained to see the connection between something we're doing that's very, very specific and its broader application. Sometimes we do a better job or a worse job of explaining that to others. But when you start trying to develop an application, it usually hits a wall of the financial world that wants proof, right? So um, I think when ISS was set up as a national lab, the thinking was that you know, NASA was not taking risks and that, that private industry would take more risks. But in some ways, in science, I would say that government agencies are sometimes more willing to try something that's connected and see what happens than private funding organizations are. So it, how do you see that connection? You know, what, how you can predict or prove that an application is going to be successful along the way? Well, I don't want to dominate all, all the airtime, but uh, my colleagues and I spent uh, a year or two uh, wearing out the shoe leather on our shoes uh, walking around the, the House of Representatives and Senate office buildings trying to persuade our representatives in Congress uh, to, to fund th this constellation of satellites. And we got a lot of pats on the back and a lot of, boy, this is a great idea. But in, in today's climate, it's just not going to happen with, with public money. It's going to take private funding to, to go to the next level. What do you think, Peter? How do you predict which applications are really going to make it all the way through, which applications are going to die on the vine? Well, being an optimist, uh, you know, if we go back quickly to the fact we had that one equation where it says that the forces go as uh, the dimensions squared. So it would be easy for me to propose no, we, since it was too unstable or very unstable, what we would do is just change the dimensions by a factor of two, that means everything would change by a factor of four, two squared. And, uh, but to sell that, again, as you suggested, is a little harder because first you go in and you wanna say how easy it is, but it turns out it's really not easy. So then you need a lot of money and that of course is difficult. Now the question is how are we going to get also industry involved because for them, uh, experiments, uh, research is expensive. So somehow that synergy has to be there between the government and industry to decide uh, where, how are we gonna supply the money to actually do the work, you know, so. Uh, but the proposal, in other words, people working on basic research always have good ideas not all of them work but the thing is you can make progress if you supply the funding I'd like so to and in your uh, discipline right yeah. it's it's got its own lingo <laughs> translational medicine how do you get from bench to bedside well actually i'd like to use this platform to make a general pitch for the importance 
uh, uh, not just stability, but growth and research federal funding for science and engineering. I mean, the multiplier effect of government spending in, in science and engineering is greater than anything else that the government does. Well, the thing that struck me the most in the panel, what I heard was what you said about it's only the United States, actually, that does the hurricane That's flights. Right. And, but if you think about what we do, too, um, Eric Kanner pointed out uh, at one point that, um, uh, that the NIH doesn't cost anything, actually. They make more than their $30 billion just from the licensing and royalty fees that came back from the inventions of funded research. Um, and so uh, one way to think about getting through this hurdle, uh, we call it the death zone getting to um, drugs, for example, from our discoveries, but, but you could say it just as well getting to your satellites and so forth is putting more funds, federal funds, on the front side. And stretch your thinking a little bit outside of your disciplines and ask from your experience and observations, not just with your own work, but what is done on the station, what other areas of science could benefit from the station which isn't benefiting now? Do you see there being new opportunities, new ways to expand? So it could be in the medical area, it could be in earth observation, it could be in fluid physics, but what should be done which isn't being done now? Who's the question for? Oh, well, all of us. <laughs> Do have this oh. little handy thing? I don't, I don't, is this something, doing anything? I'm not sure. It won't do anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, not really I, I'm not an, ast uh, an atmospheric phys uh, a physicist by, by training at all. I'm, I'm a nuclear physicist and uh, a, an astrophysicist. But I got interested in this problem. I um, uh, have close colleagues in the, in the meteorology group at MIT, and we've, we've worked together for many years. Um, and as we've gone into this, we realized that the, this three-dimensionality thing, which you can only do from low Earth orbit, it doesn't work from geosynchronous orbit where the, where the weather satellites are, can be used for many other uh, applications. For example, uh, for the purpose of numerical weather prediction, it would be wonderful to know what the wind speeds are at various altitudes. Now, over continental land masses, we launch radio sons with balloons. But three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans, and there are no radio sons launched there. If we have a cloud fragment up there, we can see it move and then determine its, its speed and its altitude. But we can, in order to determine both its speed and its altitude, one that's low will seem to move only a little bit. Um, or that could have been much higher, well, one that uh, much higher, and it would have looked like it moved much farther. So to resolve the, the aliasing between speed and altitude, you need to have that parallax effect that you get from a low Earth orbit satellite. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are other examples I could mention. So this, could, this potentially has a lot of applications for improving um, weather forecasting, uh, which would have all kinds of benefits for for farming, for, um, well, well, I could go on and on. Is this another check to write? <laughs> uh, no, it's all, all in one package, all in one package, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and you get a free set of steak knives. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Peter, uh, what about you? Uh, what do you think, whether it be in the fluid physics, combustion physics, other physics, or just other areas in general, what do you think that are opportunities for discovery on the space station that yet need to be explored? Well, not knowing the subject very well as far as, we'll say, making semiconductor devices. Because semiconductor devices, when they make them, uh, you know, it's really intermolecular forces when you get deposition and everything like that. So what you could test, uh, we'll say, different designs. Uh, for example, would you want something in the shape of a wedge, which would be very difficult to uh, make a, you know, a small device that the interface or the thin films in the shape of a wedge. Maybe uh, it might be useful. So in, in microgravity, you actually could build an experiment where you could easily do that, and you could look at it. You know, it's things like that, uh, the effect of uh, composition. You know, because all those things would be expanded as far as sensitivity. So there's many processes that use interfacial phenomena that are a function of sensitivity that might work a lot better on the space station or differently. 
So Peter, we're going to have to take you out of retirement. <laughs> and that, that's because this actually is a very important area of activity. Uh, at CASIS and NASA, we have looked at the Semiconductor Industry Association 2015 roadmap, and there they identify 3D monolithic integration and heterogeneous materials as being major problems, and a lot of that relates to growth, uh, the effects of convection and buoyancy here on Earth, and how you can mitigate that by doing these types of studies on station in microgravity. So, uh, yeah, you make a very good point. We agree. Andy, you yeah. lastly. Yeah, so I, I would say this area of dynamic integrative omics. Uh, uh, so the, what happens over relatively short periods of time and weeks to months in your genome and your metagenome, things like your exposure to and changes in, in uh, gut flora, um, how that's related to, say, something that happens like an infectious process, uh, your immune response, and looking at all the modalities we can do. The advantage of, of the, from my point of view, of the, of the space station is you have a captive audience of astronauts who will more or less do what you say <laughs> with great enthusiasm. And you also have a controlled environment. And so you have the chance to follow people in a relatively short period of time, including among what happens um, um, among each other, even like stressful events or transfer of contagion from one person to another in a way you could just never do um, on the Earth. And that could help you understand in a dynamical way in a relatively small population, although it's complicated, it's a small number of people that might help you understand the transmission of disease, the, uh, the nature of the relationship between environment and metabolism and um, your, your genome in ways I was showing in that cartoonish way in my first slide, um, and that you could apply in a general way to larger populations. So it could be a real crucible for understanding that kind of dynamics. Yeah, wh one of the things you just said that caught my attention too is because physiology, because we have homeostasis, we think of these processes as affecting us over weeks or months mm -hmm. or, or beyond. But you know, some of the most recent space station research that's really caught my eye are measurements of cellular-based responses mm -hmm. or even in plants where the response to being in a microgravity environment can be identified in gene expression in seconds. Mm -hmm. So it, um, as, as organisms, we, fake, we hide it, right? But there's something going on. Those things are happening so rapidly. And, uh, and that makes it really an interesting mix because we don't normally see change happen that quickly. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, in, uh, just, uh, just what you just said, I, I keyed on the fact that one of the advances in medicine that's happened over the last few decades is that they put instrumentation right at the bedside in things like intensive care units, emergency rooms, so they get almost instant measurements of the things that are critical, sort of life-saving things. You could put omics on a platform like the space station and really dynamically measure over very short periods of time with like watches even, like the things that could be doing sampling and get extremely short interval measurements on individuals with the sophisticated uh, instrumentation NASA's so good at doing and then integrate that with the uh, astronaut's own um, physiology and measurements. Mm -hmm. when, uh, when Chairman Babin spoke this morning, you know, he talked about the, the political challenge ahead of, of sustaining a U.S. presence in orbit, making part of our economic sphere, and how the science and discovery drives that kind of a decision that's ahead. And I, I wanted to, to get your perspective on whether you see that long-term sustained presence in low Earth orbit beginning with ISS. Do you see that as primarily a place for discovery, or is it a place for really developing industry? It's both. And, um, I think the most thrilling thing about being one of these sort of outsiders who was brought into the NASA mission, it captures what I grew up with when I was a, a boy and watching the space the program grow and see the landing on the moon. We work in splendid isolation, you know, science scientists and our you know, in our ivory towers. But this is very different. This is being part of the world's greatest science project that the United States and only the United States really could take the leadership on, of course, with partners, international partners. But it's something that gets to the American character, this dream of exploration, discovery at all elements, from basic research all the way out to practical translational effects and getting human beings off the planet Earth and into other places that's so much bigger than ourselves. I mean, what's exciting to me about this is is that I'm just one more person in this great big endeavor that is NASA and, 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 and ISS related um, enterprises that is just bigger than all of us and gets to the fundamental thing of 
what makes um, the program great, and I know it's sounding like John Glenn a little bit, but you know, what makes America great? Um, I really think that's true, and I think we shouldn't lose that dream. Peter, what do you see as the extension of industry into low Earth orbit over time versus uh, the, discovery? Well, I think, uh, you know, industry needs projects, or they need products. So how are they going to develop the products? And of course, there's some ways of doing it easier in low Earth orbit. And therefore, uh, it should be a natural synergism between industry and the government to actually work on these projects. But I guess what we need is we need to start with industry wanting to have something new or something different. And then, you know, like the battery for the automobile, you know, that's, and all of a sudden you have a project to work on and what's the be best place to work on it? Maybe not, well, NASA needs batteries. Maybe it's, you can have a different design that you could develop, you know, on the space station. So, but what, what's interesting about the growing companies is they have new projects and all of a sudden some of them succeed and uh, they, but to do that they have to have a certain amount of research. Paul, what are your, what are your thoughts? Well, I think I already expressed them, at least in my particular area of, of quasi-expertise, um, the, fact, the fact that we've now shown that a low Earth orbit gives us an opportunity to see things, to see the atmosphere in three dimensions opens up all kinds of possibilities. Another example I could mention is in, in volcanology, uh, every once every few years or several years, there's a, there's a volcanic outbreak that is severe enough that it, it, it disrupts commercial air travel. And the, the, the movement of these volcanic ash clouds uh, is very hard to predict. It's occurring at levels of the atmosphere that we, that we don't monitor very well. Uh, but from, from low Earth orbit, again, we can, we can look at these things, we can do tomography on these clouds and, and see what, you know, what they're, how they're moving, not only horizontally, but, but, uh, but vertically, and how they're changing in shape and, and dispersing and so forth. And that could be, a, they don't happen again, they happen once every maybe three years or so, but when they do happen, there was one that happened uh, about well, several years ago in Europe and caused tremendous disruption of, of commercial air traffic for a week or two in Europe. And that would be another problem that could be solved. So there, there are many examples. Wonderful. So we'd like to open up to a couple of questions from the audience, if some of you have questions. And um, I cannot see the people with the microphones, but if they could. Uh, ah, I'm seeing a sign that the microphones are not working. So. Um, but I see a hand raised. Tell you what, come up to the front, and you can tell us we'll repeat the question out loud for everyone. This has to do with your study. So the question is, um, are there applications of these kinds of weather monitoring technologies for weather on Mars or, or weather on Jupiter, storms and winds? Uh, yes, I mean, it, it depends on uh, the particular solar system object. Uh, Mars isn't particularly promising because uh, Mars is so dry. It has an atmosphere, but, but very, very thin compared to the Earth. Uh, there are dust storms, but... Um, Although there, might, there may be weather systems on Mars that, that generally resemble those on the Earth. Interestingly, the Mars day, that is the time it takes for Mars to rotate on its, on its, orb, on its uh, axis, is almost the same as the, as the time it takes for the Earth. And so you, that, that spin causes winds to, to be deflected, uh, the so-called uh, Coriolis effect, and so you'd expect to have same kinds of storms because of heatings in, by the sun in some areas and cooling in other areas, but it doesn't do much of anything. 
Uh, we have seen some interesting things on Mars. We've seen dust devils, for example, but you're never, you're never going to see a storm on Mars. The, the major planets, uh, uh, Jupiter, the red, the red spot, contrary to um, uh, widespread belief and contrary to what I read just, uh, I think it was in the New York Times a few days ago, it's not a storm, which is a cyclone. It's, a, it's an anti-cyclone. It's like a big high pressure area uh, with, with cyclones circling around the outside of it. And, and we really don't understand that well. Uh, Jupiter, Jupiter is a funny place because it is so huge that it's still producing heat from its own contraction as the sun did in, in its early days in the formation of the solar system. So in the daytime, the, at the, when the sun shines on the top of the atmosphere, the atmosphere heats up. Uh, it's, cool, it's warmer than the lower part of the atmosphere, and that stabilizes things. Uh, hot air is, is lighter than cold air, and so you don't get much action. At night, the upper atmosphere cools off, radiates away its heat to space. The heat from below in Jupiter percolates up, and now things become unstable. Hot air on the bottom, lighter, lighter and cold air on the top, and you get thunderstorms all over the place. Uh, so there's all sorts of interesting phenomena to study on Jupiter. Saturn is quite similar. Perhaps the most interesting object in the solar system is, is um, uh, 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 Saturn's satellite Titan, which has a significant atmosphere, apparently made mo mostly of methane, but the temperature is sufficient, the temperature is in the right range, that there are, there are clouds, there are storms, there are, there's an ocean of methane, that methane evaporates, goes up into form clouds and so forth, and it would be very interesting to have a satellite around uh, Titan uh, to, to measure and to see what's going on, and, and that would probably then cast more light back on what's going on in the Earth's atmosphere, as well as being, you know, a, a very great interest scientifically in its own right. Well, we've run out of time. It's been fascinating conversations. We see that the passion for the ISS is real and it will continue. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Julie. Please thank join you, me in thanking everyone. So I'd like to thank this uh, distinguished uh, panel uh, for your contributions. It reminds me of when I shared offices with Kate Rubens and Don Pettit about five years ago. A lot of mental